Welcome back to the Detect Crime Series webinar presented by Serialize. In each episode, we examine one specific aspect of how crime series work, with a little help from the excellent scholars of the Detect project, practitioners in the field, and our own Serialize instructors. In today's episode, we examine the role of the criminal protagonist in more detail. We have already talked about the appeal of the bad guy to viewers, but screenwriting manuals usually instruct us that character drives conflict. How does that work with a bad guy? What's the source of conflict there? And why are all the bad guys guys? Where are the bad girls? Let's find out. In drama writing, there's a saying that conflict comes out of character. This presupposes a character whose goals are in contradiction with other characters' goals. When this goal is in contradiction with socially accepted rules and norms, we generally speak of a bad guy. But there's another way to look at this question. It's useful to take a step back and think about what drives a TV series. Breaking Bad is a useful example of a character-driven show. This series by showrunner Vince Gilligan and his team is about a mild-mannered high school chemistry teacher who, after he is diagnosed with terminal cancer, decides to start cooking crystal meth to save his family from becoming destitute after his death. What is so revolutionary about the show is that over the course of five seasons, this high school teacher will commit every conceivable crime and still remain our hero. Why? Because as viewers, we can relate to his motivation. And that continues even after his initial motivation to provide for his family goes away. After his criminal dealings have made him so rich that money no longer has any meaning, he continues doing the drug business because it makes him feel alive. Serialized instructor Nicola Lozuadi says that such a show must be character-driven to be palatable to an audience. Why you have to be character-driven? Because the only reason why we can stick to a protagonist that kills baby is that once the story is able to make us feel that the reason why he kills is because he's a human being very complicated, split in two sides. And the ability of the story to make us emotionally feel that even if we don't kill baby, I never kill the baby, I swear, nevertheless, we feel that there is something in that human being that is like me. Mm-hmm. And so this is the real character driven. Real character driven is because of his contradiction, Walter White delivered the conflict in the story. You keep out Walter White from the story, the story mm-hmm. dies. Mm. And What Nicola is getting at is that Walter White is the source of the conflicts. Why? Because he wants something that he knows implicitly he's not supposed to have. To speak in screenwriter terms, he's split between his wants and his needs. But because Breaking Bad is a genius show that subverts our expectations, his want is to be a good moral upstanding person, whereas his need is to feel alive, to cross all existing lines and push himself to the extreme. In each episode, Walter fluctuates between those two poles of his personality and he has to negotiate with himself over the question of what kind of man he wants to be. Nicola Luzuari sees the origins of this character archetype in Judeo christian mythology. The very first book of the Bible is the Genesis, and in the, the beginning of the Genesis, you have the Eden, the, the, the paradise in, in on earth. And, and there you have the original sin, the idea of something wrong and rotten inside us since before. We, from that moment on, that story tells us that there was one moment in the very beginning that determined that something is crashed forever, something is split forever. We have to be punished because we weren't able to stick to the Paradise Project and we wanted more. Means we were split by our desire. Of course, desire is a very big word. Inside that desire, you have the uh, unpredictable, furnace of our instinct. The Bible views desire as the original punishable offense. The desire to taste something we're not supposed to have. 
and this desire makes this person a potential threat to a higher authority. Yet desire is something that is germane to all humans. In this way, every human carries the seed for destruction within him or herself. Therefore, what makes these crime stories so powerful is that we, the viewers, see ourselves in the bad guy. His moral battles are our own. The family of the show where the crime the main character is the bad guy and not the good guy, like in the first two families where you have to tendentially the good guys. The show like Breaking Bad are, are about the, the pure mystery, our ability to accept our being evil, to accept it. When you are in CSI, you are nurturing your hope that you can beat it and fix it. When you are in Breaking Bad, you are trying to accept that it's there and it's you. You feel the difference? Sherlock Holmes makes everybody hope that evil can be beaten, the problem can be fixed, justice can be done. When you are with Walter White, you can't but accept that we as human beings are in that way that the evil is inside us, means inside me, me, the viewer. I feel it inside myself. And I have just to accept it, finger crossed, hoping that the evil inside me don't push me to act too bad. The bad guy character holds up a mirror to the viewer and asks, rather provocatively, would you do the same thing? It's a conditional question, of course because that's the function of fiction, to present an alternate world and characters onto whom we can project ourselves and live out our basic instincts so that we don't have to do it in real life. Fiction may offer us a parallel world, but it's still a world that's circumscribed by the assumptions and prejudices of our own world. That's why crime series are such rich ground for cultural analysis. One of the questions that arises, why do we always talk about the bad guy? The tech scholar Federico Pagello has one possible answer. Most of uh, the criminal anti-heroes of complex television, both in the US and in Europe, are male, or they have been so far male. So a common topic that has been much discussed also by critics and scholars is the fact of how much this uh, gangster figures have been used to explore the crisis of masculinity in contemporary society and the struggles and the, the we can say the bad reactions that that a lot of male subjects can experience in this new context in which traditional forms of subjectivity of male subjectivity has been played out the criminal um, context can be seen as simply a very exciting and thrilling representation, for instance, of professional economic struggles. So it's easy to see in uh, um, both Tony Soprano and, uh, and Walter White uh, a study on the representation of white American middle class men struggling to, to cope with uh, what is required by them as, as uh, male subject, as fathers, uh, as traditional, the leading figure of the family, of the middle class family that uh, are going through some difficult times in the new world. The crisis of masculinity arises out of an economic and social context where the white middle class male is no longer in a position to provide for his family with a nine to five job. The pilot of Breaking Bad establishes that Walter's income as a high school teacher is not enough to feed his family. In fact, he has to take on extra shifts at a local car wash to make some much needed cash. He is humiliated when he has to towel off the wheels of his student's car. But it's not just the lack of a well-paid job that emasculates Walter White. It's the whole construct of middle-class respectability that fences in his deeper animal instincts. Only after he breaks the leg of some punk who dissed his son does Walter rediscover his sexual libido. Should we read this as a subtle suggestion that violence and sexual prowess are somehow linked? 
can a man truly only perform sexually if he gets to break stuff? But this crisis of masculinity is not enough to answer the question of why there are so few bad girls. Federico remarks that this is slowly changing. Women are becoming more integral, integral to the storytelling in some recent mobster dramas. Again, in the trilogy, Romanzo Criminale, Gomorra and Subora, uh, the last of these three series, Subora, which is a Netflix production, which uh, I think is even more so operatic in its style and in the obvious selection and creation of characters that represent different types of, of people and with the growing inclusion of female characters that becomes more and more active in terms of uh, the representation of empower the uh, women but also uh, active in the story in the sense that their role in the narrative is uh, more and more relevant whereas in the that was not the case in the previous um, in the book and the, the film that was based on the same uh, on the same story. One of the reasons for this evolution has to do with the entry of a certain new player into the programming game. But in the TV series, you see the impact of uh, Netflix approach to narrative and uh, their interest in uh, um, diversity, also ethnic diversity and gender diversity and sexual orientation. So one of the main characters of, of um, Subura La Serie is, um, is a Sinti gay um, young man uh, whose relationship with his tribal uh, background, with the, 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 his family, which is the, the, the protagonist, of, one of the protagonists of this organized crime uh, situation, becomes also a way to explore very, in a very melodramatic way his sexuality, his relationship to, to the father, the brother, the mother, and, and the family as a whole. And, and through his story also, you see more and more these other female characters becoming important in his uh, professional life, so in the criminal plotline, as well as in uh, um, personal, emotional life. He's uh, coming to terms with his homosexuality and, um, and how this <laughs> will work in such a <laughs> peculiar environment. So some dramas are moving past the focus on the white middle-class male as the center of narrative story. These changes in cultural representation can be, at least partially, attributed to the changes in the industrial landscape. If the broadcaster or streamer wants to reach a more diverse, inclusive audience, then the characters depicted also get to be more diverse and varied. Of course, another explanation can also be changing attitudes among viewers. As viewers, we are simply more comfortable watching a more diverse cast of characters. And we may also seek to see characters and themes that are closer to our own lived experience. Should we really assume that no woman has ever fantasized about shooting someone? After all, the parable of eating the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden not only involved an Adam, but also a woman named Eve. Could Walter White have been a woman? The question is not whether a woman can do evil things. We've seen many stories where a woman is forced to make difficult decisions in order to protect herself and her family. The more tantalizing question is whether a woman would do evil deeds for their own sake and still remain our hero, in the same way that we stayed on board with Walter White in his transformation from the gentle Mr. Chips into the ruthless Scarface. It's a simple enough question, yet often broadcast executives have tied themselves up in knots trying to answer or rather avoid it. That's possibly the reason why Killing Eve has become such a watershed moment in TV history. The audacity of that show is not to put two females in the lead, one a contract killer and the other the agent assigned to hunt her down, but that the assassin is an unapologetic sociopath who thrives on killing people. In the pilot, Villanelle, a cold-blooded contract killer, leaves a trail of murders across Europe. 
MI5 protection agent Eve Polastri suspects a female assassin behind the killings, but her theory is dismissed by her male superiors. When she interferes with the investigation of one of the murder cases, she is fired from her job. But Caroline Martins, the head of MI6's Russia division, hires her for a secret assignment to hunt down the supposed female killer. Villanelle is soon alerted that Eve is on her trails. What follows is an intricate cat and mouse game across Europe. Killing Eve is part of a subgenre of crime series that I call the criminal romance. It follows in the tradition of The Catch, a romantic comedy drama about a private investigator who is intent on catching the man who defrauded her of her money, and the much darker The Fall, about a detective who must catch a serial rapist murderer. In those cases, it is the morally upstanding woman who must catch the transgressive male. Killing Eve upsets that formula by making the target a ruthless woman. Villanelle kills without remorse. She has no moral conflict. In fact, killing fills her with sexual satisfaction. Here again we see a connection between intense violence and sexual libido, except in this case it's female sexuality that is depicted, another transgression of sorts. Even more shockingly, the show has been a commercial and critical hit in the US and the UK. Audiences there seem to be ready to accept women with a killer instinct. Of course, the show makes clear that Villanelle's behavior is pathological. We learn that she was mistreated as a child and programmed to be a killer. But she shows early on that she's nobody's puppet and has a mind of her own. The attraction of Villanelle lies in her ruthlessly transgressive behavior. She's deliciously evil and gives us, as viewers, license to relish truly awful behavior. As protagonist, Villanelle is balanced out by Eve. Eve is a moral person and deeply empathetic. In Killing Eve, the two sides of Walter White's personality have been separated out into two individual characters. The ethical conflict that occurs inside Walter White has now been externalized as a cat and mouse game between contra killer Villanelle and MI6 agent Eve. Eve must negotiate between bringing Villanelle to justice and her own growing obsession with and feelings for this woman. Executive producer Emerald Fennell, head writer of season two, has asked the question, what does it look like when a psychopath starts to learn how to feel things and when a woman who's incredibly empathetic and intuitive starts to lose those parts of herself? Every subgenre of crime challenges us to ask an ethical question from a slightly different perspective. In the criminal romance, the question that is being raised is, can you stay good? even when you're in passionately in love. Nicola Luzuari has helped me frame it better than this. And so the relational show you are talking about is a challenge from the point of view of how a passion can be disruptive in everything of our life. And so are you able to resist, to stick, to your goal and uh, to your ethical compass, uh, even when you experience uh, a very, very strong passion. And the relationship between our ethical standing and our passions is a, a, a permanent. You are a detective. You find out that all the clue point to the woman you love. What do you do? Of course, you, 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 you experience a conflict inside yourself. Or the person you love is in danger because of your investigation. What do you do? And so it's a subfamily that, that challenge the ethical question from the point of view of our passions and desire. As a crime series, Killing Eve offers some useful lessons to screenwriters. It kicks open the door for female criminal leads and allows them themes of obsession and self-empowerment. Screenwriters writing today should feel emboldened to seek out themes and characters, male or female, that are unexpected and have not been written to death, pun intended. But in all this, we should always ask ourselves, what is the ethical question that is being raised here? And can I, as writer and as viewer, see myself in this?
In addition to this webinar, we're also organizing a contest for new original series ideas for either broadcast or streaming services. The proposed show should challenge and push the genre in un unexpected ways and use crime narratives to explore the richness and complexity of European societies. An international jury of top professionals from the broadcast and streaming industries will review the top five submissions. The winning author or team of authors will be invited to attend the DETECT final conference in Rome in June 2021 and meet the members of the jury. You can go to the link in the show notes of this episode to find out more about this contest.